Yes, I'm presenting, so just put it on and you know what to do, right? Yes, yes. Everything is on course. I'm presenting. No? Yeah. No, 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 no. Over there. <laughs> I don't care. I'm you do that one here. Thank you. 
Ini gue kucak kucak semua ini, So we're supposed to be in room 11, please. So you left this on the ground and you are plugging this one. You, you left the camera clip and you are plugging the speaker. This is the speaker. I pull this out now. This is, I put I pick this on the floor. It was plugged. Maybe this this it was on the ground. Where is the camera? It was connected. It was working. It, 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 this 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 was what was here. Don't plug any of that in on this. Yeah, apart from this. Yeah, yeah. I collected your parts. Yes, yes. Have you started it so? Yes, I have. Yeah. Okay, I started it. I The chair of the panel is supposed to present this. Then we are going I didn't see stuff. Yes. I'm going to talk about trying to gather all the people. Because they are best to do it. Like, I agree. Seven, three people. And we are friends. Yes, I was all right. 
Sorry, I didn't get that. What did you say? Yes, yes, yes. Just check. Yeah, so um, thank you everyone for coming. Um, yeah, so um, we start in a minute. Yes, in a minute. So I just want to um, acknowledge the presence of some. Yeah, so we have. Yes, you have share yeah. here. And um, sorry, take it to the video. Still online. Online. Oh, yes, yes, online. Online. Yes, yes. Then, um, hope. Yes, yes, it's Um, found only few doors. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. So, yeah, can I just start? Money, if for an extended yes, it forms as a We are going to start immediately, and it will get that in a ten minutes in this presentation.
So we will do prepare slide because we will do know that we have opportunities for the power for its education. Nevertheless, I wanna the title of our paper policies of water so far. It's in the denial of the 2023. Of course, I know he is the lead author. But by the virtue of his uh, responsibility, he has delegated me to present the paper. So I will just talk, and if he has something to add to the paper, he will do. Uh, but um, I know people will begin to ask why politics of water supply? Is it that there is rainfall in the Lagos, Benue, Delta, Kaduna, and all that, whereas there is none in uh, Ebony states. Of course, uh, other people may also ask who plays the politics and what is the effect of these politics in the supply of water to the people of uh, Ebony. In fact, all these questions drive our curiosity to delve into this topic. And uh, in discussing this topic, we we break them, we break it into three segments. We look at the geography of uh, Bonny states. We also look at the number of local government that exists in uh, Bonny states and the geopolitical grouping of, of the local governments and then the occupation. And uh, on the two second segments, we, are, we shall be looking at the general situation in uh, Bonny states before the state creation and uh, possibly look at the politics itself and who plays the politics. Of course, as we know that Ebony State is the newest created state of Nigeria. It was created in 1996 by the then military head of state, General Sane Abacha. And uh, before the creation, the people had suffered a lot of um, scarcity of water. So, and uh, before then, there exist two provinces in uh, uh, Ebony. We have the Goja province and the Omaha province. The Nabakliki province falls under the Goja province, while the Afiku block falls under the, the uh, Omaha province. So in these two existing provinces, we have, when Ebony was created, it was, I think, Abakliki had eight local governments and then I think we has, you know, five, making it 13 local governments that exist in um, Ebony states. And geopolitically, these five local governments were grouped into a Bakliki block and then the Afiko block. And the uh, Ebony, as it is, is surrounded by you know, states that have access to the water. And that is to say that Ebony state is a seafaring state, which ordinarily the people don't suppose to, to lack water. And then um, the people there are predominantly you know, agriculturalists growing food crops, cash crops, and all that, with some, you know, sizable population that deal uh, in trading and others in politics. So generally, the life of people of a bunny state was so miserable when it comes to, to water supply that when a uh, bunny state was created under any new states. Uh, there was this scarcity of water, which by that time, when somebody refers to you as a bunny man, you always feel inferior. And that inferiority stigmatizes the people of a bunny, particularly those that come from the Abakliki block. 
because the area was so bushy, so dusty. And uh, when somebody is coming from the rural area, you quickly, you know, inform opinion about that person that this particular person is from Abakliki. And uh, because of that, uh, people from Abakliki block particularly find it difficult to intermingle with those from Anambra, Imo, Lagos, and so on and so forth. So the general situation is that the people find it difficult to actually uh, identify where they come from. Some of them who had opportunity to travel outside the Abakliki always try to hide their identity. And uh, as a result of that, when the state was created, the, the situation was that People fetch water from the ponds, well, and the uh, dam. That was the only source of water at that time. And uh, unfortunately, these people that drink from the ponds and water, uh, some of them who have livestock, like domestic animals, like goats, uh, dogs, birds, and all that, allow these domestic animals to also drink from the same ponds or dam which the people drink from. Sometimes this animal after drinking, we urinate inside that, uh, that uh, well or dam, and after which people will still come back to fetch water from there and drink. So this resulted to outbreak of cholera, which a lot of people from their Bakliki block suffered from and died as a result of that. And many of them suffered guinea worm diseases such that once, uh, it may, when we were in school, once somebody say, ah, this person is from a Berkeley today, say, gain a worm. So it was, it, it is germane to say that uh, a Berkeley was synonymous to gain a was uh, reticulated there, meaning that the power pl plants were supplying water to those in the rural areas and then those in the urban areas. So, but when the uh, government of Dave Mumari, who just booted out of office uh, on 29th May 2023 came on board, what he did was to uh, unearth those uh, uh, pipelines and uh, dismember them, took them to unknown destination and uh, sold them and possibly uh, diverted the money to the to into his pockets. So the situation in Abakliki now is that the only source of water which Abakliki drinks from is from the bonghole. And the bonghole in, in, in Abakliki is so, so salty that people find it difficult to even uh, face the water. It is only those who have you know, a little financial uh, power that uh, buy aquarafa and other uh, uh, pure water to, to drink. But the, generally, about 95% of the uh, Bonye people, particularly those in a, uh, a Bakliki block, drink bongo, this salty bongo in a Bonye. Thank you, and God bless. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Presenter. Thank you. We are reaching our time by two minutes. To allow you because of the design nature of that topic, to allow you to go. So, the next person to present, I think we will do the question and answer question after the presentation. That's the best thing to do. That's the model. The next person to present is uh, uh, the Mito Pebelo, titled Between Domestic Burden and Street Violence The Dilemma of Care Focus in the Modern Metropolis. To meet up with them. It's online. It's online. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. Yes, now that. Yeah. there. Okay, yes. thank you. Yes, you. my name is Dr. Benito Belu from Colada IC University. Just like the chair said, the topic that I will be presenting is between domestic burden and street violence, the dilemma of girl orcas in the southwest metropolitan city of cities of Nigeria. I don't know if I can share my screen. Come again, because what you had here is a forecast in a badan metropolis. I are saying Southwest. 
Okay. Yeah. Okay. In the bad, okay, there must have there must have been some modification. I don't know, but the 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 emphasis is still on the southwest Nigeria, and Ibadan is spoke is picked as the case study. Area of study. Okay. Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. We have noticed that since the last two decades, developing countries in Africa and particularly Nigeria have been experiencing ra rapid modernization, urbanization. And this has been manifesting in population explosions, urban poverty, and indeed the vanishing kinship system. And we are beginning to see evidences of these implications that has even compounded the already existing problem of cultural stereotypic restrictions to girl child development that have produced socioeconomic gender based challenges. And one of these challenges is gendered insecurity. So it is like the new modern city and industrialization and urbanization generally has compounded what already exists as gendered uh, stereotypic restrictions, and all of which have probably given us a, a, a larger understanding of the need to address the gendered insecurity issue. We have realized that girls and girl workers in the urban centers have steadily formed the center of discourse on gendered insecurity, as be because their encounters offer something like a multi-dimensional perspective to investigating all forms of threats and cruelty that cause harm to young girls. And why is this so? Because their, their survival and livelihood in the domestic and public sphere are directly linked to their active participation and their ability to withstand embedded victimhood. That, is, that we see on both sides, both in the domestic and public sphere. So on the one hand, pieces of evidences like the statistics from UNICEF, particularly in 2016, has categorically, categorically revealed that girls between the ages of five and 15 thereabout spend like 40% more of their time on unpaid household chores than boys of their age, and thereby limiting their inclination to engaging in childhood development, developmental activities. So, and on the other hand, these same girls, girl children, have been involving in small scale informal enterprises in Nigeria metropolitan cities, because these are largely where we have a lot of people, series of, series of threats on the streets because we are beginning to see more of them, more of these girls coming to the streets because we see them as more, you know, being able, being more capable than girls or boys of their age to do this business. So what exactly is the problem? So that's by the rapidly expanding violence and insecurity discourses in research, that multidimensional aspect of girl child exposure to insecurity is still not looked at. We have looked at instances of domestic threat. We have looked, looked at instances of street violence, but we are not looking at where girl workers in particularly are experiencing these two, these two challenges. And that is what is uh, prompting us to look into the, to, to take this study more seriously. So in this research, we, are, we have looked at the general discussions about gender insecurity. We have looked at girls, household management and domestic burden, looking at what exactly has been the, the, role, the, the place of girls and why is it an issue. We have looked at girls and, this, and street violence and we have looked, of course, we have looked at urbanization and urban poverty. All this review of literature have helped us to create, understand that there is a gap that while we have studied gender insecurity, we have not looked at it from the multidimensional perspective. While we have looked at domestic burden, we have not critically looked at girls who are on the streets who are also burdened from domestic from the street perspective. And then we have, we have, we have while we are looking at the street violence, we are not looking at we are only looking at street violence from gang related issues. We are not looking at street violence, particularly as it affects you know, feminism, as, as it affects the female gender. So the, the research is, of course, the theory, the methodology of the research 
looks at, uh, it is ethnographic in nature because it, it, we are looking critically at girls, the girl orcas in the, in, the, in, the, in the heart of the cities. So we, are, we have looked at areas of, like Ojo, Iwo Road, and Akinyele local government. And this, you know, Akinyele local government and Northeast local government respectively. So these two places, Ojo and Iwo Road, are where we have seminars and, and the large uh, motor parks where we see a lot of activities of hawking and thereabouts. So both the secondary and primary sources of data are being gathered to provide you know, the information that we need because we would need to look at this secondary information of what has been done, what are the related statistics that we have about girl hawking and related household, household um, activities involving girl, even though this information are very, very limited, but we have been able to get some and the work is still ongoing. So primary sources are of course from the, from the orcas themselves, the in-depth interview of these girl orcas in the motor parks motor park workers, the, even the drivers, motor park women traders among, along the, uh, in the motor parks. We have, we have concentrated so much on the motor parks, just like I said, because it has a concentration of hawking and series of activities that would help us to get a lot of information. So these girls are expected to give us not only what happens on the street, but what happens to their home, because we do not have access to getting to their homes. The only way we can identify these girl workers is to visit them on sites, particularly in the street, where we can, uh, where we were able to gather exchange information about their encounters and what they are, what they are feeling. So what we have been gathered so far about girl workers, as housekeepers in the in the city of Iba is that Ibadan is that many of the girl workers are not living with both of their parents. You see that one parent is dead, or one parent, or both parents have separated, and all that, all sort of, you know, issues concerning, you know, parenthood, directly affecting these children. And and then secondly, there is this social cultural belief that more girls than boys work because the girls are seen as more profitable, like they are more attractive. They will get, you know, they will get more customers because the people buy sent sentimentally buy from them and all that and all that so and then all these girls that were interviewed carrying they, they all carry out domestic chores in the presence or absence of other family members irrespective of the presence or absence of other family members they still do domestic chores and then there is the issue of time poverty among girls it is very evident because most of these girls some of them do not even have time to do their homework they still go back to school. Some of them do not even do their homework. Some of them do not have even stopped going to school. So these are a lot of complications that we found, particularly among these girls. So more school dropouts, just like I said, among these girl workers, because they could, it was difficult for them to combine both working and you know, doing domestic chores. And then we found out that they were sexual and gender-based violence, even though these girls were not really talking about this area. We, we, what I was able to gather from, from, from the discussions with them is that they do not really feel comfortable about going to some places and the motor parks because they are being seen as, um, they, they fear the, some act, activities that do not really go down well with them, I mean, concerning their sexuality. So it was, it was deductible that it is evident that uh, they experience some kind of abuse and uh, molestation or harassment, as the case may be on, on, on the street. So we, what we have been able to gather is that there's multi-level gendered insecurity in play that we have found. So that is, uh, that, is the, that is what I've been able to identify and I hope that I will get them also. Just like I said, the work is still ongoing and I am hoping that the, um, what I get from the, from the outcome of the of, of, of this of this panel will also enrich the work further. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Timitope, for your wonderful presentation. We now call you, on sir. the next we now call on the next presenter. Damilola Lola Yes. Okay. The chamber is titled Cities Places. Social justice and low income communities in Lagos. 
Sorry, could you please stop sharing your screen? Let me go back. Uh, yeah. That's bad. That time is okay. 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 Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Daniel Laulaleko. I'm a doctoral candidate and lecturer in the Department of Urban and Regional Planning, University of Lagos. And I'll be speaking on city spaces, social justice, and low income communities in Lagos. I'll just have to state it that this is a work in progress. And we've not even gotten to the methodology yet, so I'll be expecting constructive feedback from everyone. Next slide, please. Thank you. So um the issue of social justice has been dominating um the global discourse now, especially with the advent of the SDGs, where it says that um, the agenda is leave no one behind. So the issue of social justice has been going on where everybody has, is talking about equality, equity, and the like. Uh, but uh, when you say social justice, it entails the fair distribution of wealth, opportunities, and privileges within a society, irrespective of your background, of your race, of your ethnic group, of your social uh, economic background, your social background, of your religion. Now, this, in order to achieve this, it is a very big challenge especially in the global south where cities are struggling to provide equitable and adequate infrastructure, as well as opportunities for people, especially in low income communities. So now how do we achieve this social justice? The dynamics of social injustice has also been experienced in Lagos, Nigeria. You know, Lagos is the, one of the fastest growing cities in the world right now. And also, um, and like I said, I mentioned earlier, Lagos has several social injustices and inequalities where the percentage of low income earners continue to rise. And the inequality is not just about um, the income level, it's also cross across gender level, where according to studies, um, that we have more women living in poverty compared to men. And we can say that these women bear the brunt of from lack of infrastructures and the basic services needed. Now, this study looks to highlight the influences of the past and present arrangement and provisions in Lagos towards creating a better and future, a better future for marginalized and vulnerable society. Like I said, we are looking at the past and the present that for us to influence our future. Pre-colonial arrangement of spaces in Lagos, how Lagos was before colonial influence. Um, then the center of the town was very, very essential. It was essential, it was symbolic, it was functional in the pre-colonial arrangement of spaces in Yoruba land. The upper palace was placed in the center and close to it, we have, um, close to the upper palace, we have an open space in which the principal market was held. We call it, um, we call it Oja Oba, like, like uh, invariably means um, the king's market. Um, the second picture shows um, the setting, then that's the setting of the market. Then you have an open space and people come, they display their goods. Whereas there are smaller markets located within the town also creating a sub nucleus. So the setting there was like a nucleus. The king has the, uh, its, own, uh, its own palace in the middle and other things sprung out from it. This is to ensure fortification. But most important, importantly, there was a form of cohabitation then in the pre colonial uh, setting. Uh, where, where you live, where you stay, who you stay with has nothing to do with how much do you earn, how much do you have, or uh, where are you from? People were living in harmony. Then come um, the colonial arrangements. The pattern that existed in the pre-colonial Lagos was altered by the advent of the British colonialism. When um, the colonial masters came, they introduced special legal and psychological boundaries where uh, they imposed and enforced divisions between 
so-called income groups and racial groups. Um, a Cameroonian philosopher, historian, Akile Bembe, he mentioned in his book um, on the post-colony that in any place you see a colonial sovereignty, there must be three violences. The first one is founding violence. The second is violence to maintain the authority. And the fourth is war. So the colonial masters use this segregation to influence violence, influence disunity amongst the people for them to retain their authority. By 1819, uh, Lagos then, that was, was just moved to the island, Lagos Island, it consisted of four distinct quarters inhabited by different income or racial groups. One is the Europeans, uh, they inhabited and they were staying in the marina and they called it um, the ERAs, that's European residential areas. And it was the most important part of Lagos then. The second is the uh, Brazilian repatriates, um, those that came back from Brazil. They lived in the Portuguese town. Now it's called Coco Aguda, um, the eastern part of Lagos Island. The third um, division is the liberated slaves from Syria alone. They live, uh, they occupy um, the rest of Olobo, Lagos Island also, they call them the Saro. And the fourth is the indigenous Lagosians, the natives. They live on the rest of um, Lagos Island, the Itzaleko, the Okuawo, the Moshalashi Street, and the likes. And um, the, legal, the legal structure created by the British um, colonial masters, they um, they had several laws to back up this division. It's not just, just, they didn't just come up and say, we want to divide you. They brought out legal enforcement, like the 1904 Cantonment Proclamation that made them create the ERAs, the 1912 um, Township Ordinance that made them divide, not just in Lagos now, that made them divide cities in Lagos into, in Nigeria into classes, that we had the first class, this is a town, the second class town, the third class, and Lagos was the only first class town. There were 11 um, second class towns where Ibadan, Kano, Aba were among, and there were several third class towns. So all, this kind of thing still, it's filled that disunity that, okay, you are a first class, I'm second class, and Ibadan is older than Lagos, Kano is older than Lagos, and they placed Lagos over there. Okay, so now, uh, like I said, um, by 20, uh, 1929, there was a clear segregation. People of uh, this race is there, people of that race is there. And on the other hand, there was this densely populated African settlement, and the ERAs were looking over them. In their own comfort, um, in their own place, in their own reserved areas, they have several amenities. They have good water supply, good roads, well planned places, well laid out roads. But in the native area, nothing was provided for them because um, they, I didn't, they didn't think they deserve it. So the only thing that was provided was cemetery because they thought initially people were just burying their dead anyhow. So the, um, the stench from the corpse was affecting their royal noses. So they thought, let us create cemetery for them so they will bury their dead in a good way. So that was the only reason they created cemeteries. But um, this came back to bite them in. Sorry, to buy them. I don't want to say that word. Sorry. Um, well, in 1928, when there was um, there was a bubonic plague outbreak in Lagos Island, that a lot of people died, and so they thought, oh, we have to change the way we do things. So that was when the first reclamation um, agenda came up, that they moved people from Okwawo and they had to do a large uh, bar renewal and move them to Yaba. That was when the uh, development started moving from Lagos Island to Lagos mainland. So um, the colonial Lagos was, uh, was characterized by hierarchy of rights, in which some individuals had more opportunities and more access to resources than others. Now, the Lagos we are in today. So, um, the result of, um, of a study was posted yesterday um, that Lagos ranks among top five of the most uncomfortable cities to live in the world, not Nigeria, not Africa, in the world, top five uncomfortable cities to live in the world. That is, that is something else. And now Lagos is confronted with this psychological and social cultural divide. This is a war on its own. I live on the island, you live on the mainland. Not even talk of those that live in Ikoroju, Ekpe, Badavi, that's another fight on its own. 
Because um, people say that if you live in Korodu, you don't live in Lagos mainland. If you live in Ekba, you don't live in Lagos island. So the psychological and social cultural war is there in Lagos. And there's this visible income segregation where we have eyebrow areas and low brow areas. Um, you know, uh, where you know that certain people live in Ikori, certain people live in Ajegunle, certain people live in Makoko, the segregation is still there. And now, uh, similar to most um, large metropolitan, uh, much, uh, sorry, large cities in sub-Saharan Africa, Lagos is also plagued with infrastructure deficits. People are coming in every day, even though people are still going out every day, you can't compare the number of people that come in daily to those that go out. So co population is still increasing. And now, to provide infrastructure for these people is a problem, particularly those in low and lowest income communities. They are the ones that are bearing this wala. Pardon the word, sorry. So over the past 50 years, Lagos has experienced urban expansion and densification and the emergence of sprawling slum settlement and satellite towns with intense competition for land and housing as other um, infrastructure. People want to survive, people want to live, people want to eat, people want to work. So they've, uh, they've uh, devised a lot of ways. They don't wait for government to do that. That's why we have informal settlements. That's where we have made up um, shelter because they can't just continue living under the bridge. Even under the bridges now, some bridges, you will see shelter there that people live there. But this is how Lagos fights back. Lagosians fight back. This is how they show how resilient they are. This map shows um, the slum settlements in Lagos. Right now, we have more than 100 slum and squatter settlements in Lagos, scattered all over the 20 local government and the 57 LCDAs in Lagos. And these um, settlements, they lack basic amenities, water, education, health, good roads, and the like. And for them to be up with these deficiencies from the government, they are, like I said, they've devised their own means. And then you see all these low, um, they call it low quality schools, where you have just like maybe a shop size or a, a I don't know, maybe desk and tables and you see a teacher teaching students because they can't afford to take their students, their children to somewhere else. And at the end of the day, the only thing these low cost schools can afford is primary or nursery schools. But to further to high school is always very difficult. So most of them in these low income communities, they can't send their students, their, their children to high schools. So after primary school, they just join their parents in their own, in the job they do or look for a job elsewhere. Healthcare also, and there are some communities that they do not have access to poor health, uh, to good healthcare, water supply, they have to devise their own means to get all these things. Okay, now the social elite, the one percent of the one percent in Lagos are the ones enjoying this, are the ones enjoying good housing, they are the ones enjoying good infrastructure. And if the infrastructure that are present, the ones that were inspired by Western planning ideas, the one that were inspired that we want Lagos to be the next New York, the one that were inspired by the idea that we want Lagos to be the next Dubai, they are not easily accessible by residents in low income communities. I mean, I, I, I cannot actually say that the one of the most successful mega projects that was done in Lagos that, I, that every income group has enjoyed is the BRT. Every income group has enjoyed that BRT, irrespective of whether you are poor, whether you are rich. But all the other ideas influenced by Western ideals, it's only been enjoyed by the elites. So, um, like I said, it's a work in progress, but the methodology, we, uh, we want to have like a participatory form of methodology where we work along with the people in these low income communities. The first is we, we can be done um, data review on sociological, historical and economic data from already published work. While interviews will be conducted in selected low income communities in Lagos, focus group discussions as well, and transit work and mapping. This will be done like to walk around the communities with guide actually to get a first hand experience of what they do, how they live and how they survive. Vision boards and vision mapping. This will be done to get opinions of these people on what they see, how they envision in Lagos that benefits them as well. And the validation workshop will be carried out to 
show them the their responses so far if they are going against it or not. I'm almost done, sir. If they are going against it or not. And also, we are looking forward to invite policymakers to tell them our, our findings also. Now, we ambition to, to provide answers to, to provide answers to these questions. How can we reconstruct a past that pays equal attention to change over both time and space? How can we reconcile the inequities against the marginalized urban residents in Lagos? How can we step back from colonial legacies and place Africa at the center of city and people development? How can we leverage on the lived experience of everyday Lagosians for suitable urban development? Thank you. Thank you, Damilola, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I'll call on the next presenter. Who? A focus with a paper titled Impoverished Infrastructure, Calling Water, Sanitation, and Hygiene in Lagos. Madam, you are welcome. Thank you, Hello. So, so I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. Madam, thanks to you. Okay. Good morning, house. My name is Hope Afuka Oridri. I'm a doctoral candidate of the Mass Communication Department, University of Lagos. This is actually a concluded work, and it is titled Improvised Infrastructure, Water Sanitation and Hygiene in Urban Lagos. Actually, this study was carried out in three urban slum communities across Lagos State. And the primary focus, those who were, those who were interviewed and surveyed, were mothers who have under five children. The focus again of the work is to see how the practice of wash, that is the use of water, sanitation, and hygiene, how it affects or impacts the, the health and life of under five children. The reason for this is that as we speak today, data from the WHO, the data from the UNICEF shows that Nigeria is number one on the list of under five mortality in the world. Okay, so Nigeria is number one on the list of under five mortality in the world. And the reasons are not far fetched. It is because of poor wash. Now, why did I take this as interest? Various bodies have said Nigeria is making good progress in, in the practice of wash. So if Nigeria is making good progress, why is Nigeria still number one in the world of under five mortality? So we looked at it. In 2018, when, when Nigeria was having a lot of series of problems with under five mortality, President Muhammad Buhari declared a state of emergency in the wash sector and called for concerted efforts for improvement in wash. But even while that happened in 2019, Nigeria still became number one on the list from number two. That means something was not being done right. Now we look at improvised infrastructure for water sanitation and hygiene in urban Lagos. We, we have seen that the study has also seen that uh, 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 communities in slum, slum dwellers lack access to wash facilities. They don't have safe water supply sources. They don't have improved sanitation facilities. They also don't have wash facilities. And then we looked at it even in instances in cases where they do i want to i want to speak from the angle of publication even in cases where they do are they exposed to information are they exposed to messages are they exposed to the messages of wash that can enable them have understanding of what they should do how they should practice wash that is very key and even if they do for us as communicators it is important to ascertain the the, the medium or the channels of communication. If you, if you say you have all facilities in place, if you say you have the information, if you do not reach the people through the right channels, then that effort is in vain. If you want to speak to somebody, let's say somebody in a purely Yoruba setting, Yoruba speaking setting, and you go to speak with them in Igbo, you have wasted that campaign. 
if you go to a purely evil setting and you go to speak to them in Europe, but you also miss that campaign. Then if you also go to a setting where the people do not have access to maybe uh, mass, the mass media uh, 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 channels like television or radio, you are also not going to do the right thing. So we sought, we sought out to look how if the say these people are being given these messages, if they are exposed to watch messages, what are the media of communication? And if you say the media of communication is right, what other factors could be responsible why this uh, uh, Nigeria still stands number one on the list of under five mortality? And the primary concern for us is to look at the mothers, mothers who have under five children and caregivers of under five children to ascertain what they are doing with whatever message they have been able to get at all. So look at improvised infrastructure. Why are we talking about infrastructure? Even if government has the best policies in place, if government has everything in place to provide wash for people. What about those in the slum dwelling? I would like to tell you that in Lagos, those in so even people who live in the regular places that are well-planned, they have challenges of access to uh, the safe water, they still have challenges to uh, improve uh, the sanitation facilities. And as I speak with you, even in the best of places today, if you move around in every 100 facility you go to, you may not find more than 10 places where you will see wash facilities. People, it was only during the COVID, people just scampered for facilities to wash their hands with soap and water. I've had a uh, course, and in fact, not, not twice, not three times, to watch people go into restaurants to eat. And in every 10, you will probably find just one person who wash their hands with soap and water before they eat. The other people who eat, when they finish eating, they will now use soap to wash the oil off their hands, and they have succeeded in eating the bacteria into their stomach. So now, the, the data we have is showing us, actually this is uh, uh, ahead of the 2023 World Water Day, which, which takes place annually on March 22nd. The, the country manager for uh, UNICEF, Water Aid and even UNICEF was said, for Nigeria, in fact, particularly in Lagos State, you have one quarter of children who are suffering for poor wash as a result of limited access to water. Then you have two quarter of children who are also suffering from the results of poor wash as a result of poor sanitation facilities. And then you have three quarter of the children who are also suffering from poor wash as a result of lack of access to hand washing facilities. And then the, the, the emphasis by the, the country manager of UL Water Aid says there must be policy to encourage people to be able to come and invest in, in wash facilities because if there's no policy, nobody wants to just come and make their investments and then tomorrow they say, oh, this thing is no longer working or we cannot support you. So the call on that occasion is that there should be policies that can give them that confidence of investment so that government and donor agencies, donor agencies, I mean, can be able to invest properly in infrastructure that can provide adequate wash for the people in Lagos. Now, what is the need for improved wash infrastructure? We have seen it. If you look to the photograph there, you see this is one of the communities where I worked. What I did, the, my methodology for my study was survey, in-depth interview, and observer participants. I, I moved very early on, about three occasions, early in the morning at about 7 a.m. into the communities to find out how the people are sourcing their water, where they are sourcing their water, and what they are doing with the water. And I found this. We're talking about the need for improved infrastructure. But if you see this, these are, these are water pipes running through uh, very messy areas. And if you see what the young man is doing, the, the, he actually losing the pipe and was taking water. And at the end of the day, he was trying to fix it back. He moved into a gutter, took a nylon outside, and that nylon bag had poo on it. He flung it off, took, went into the gutter again, took another one. So what he has simply done is he has helped people who use the water in front to pack enough bacteria. And he comes back and ties it up again. So there is every need for government to provide infrastructure. If government does not, if you allow these slum communities, this this uh, uh, informal dwelling, so keep on improvising, managing themselves, definitely the facilities that they can have access or that they can provide will also be another source of problem to them. Okay, so we can also see, see this is also another community in the slum dwelling in Lagos. 
what this young boy does, I, 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 this was also taken. I took a video and this photograph at about 7 a.m. as well. The young man, because they cannot afford to buy water, they go there very early in the morning. They lose the pipe there. They lose the pipe, take the water they want to take, and they fix it back. So as, as much bacteria as possible, we follow the water. So even people would think that they have access to piped water. And then I just try to look at what is obtained in other African countries. In Kenya, they have to put a play in place. A framework that, that supported PPP, like private, private, private public partnership. And they were able to do that because the people had the confidence that whatever uh, investment they were doing is backed by policy and they are not going to lose. In South Africa as well, they also have that framework in place. What we see in, in 2022, a specialist in war in water talked about why South Africa suffered so much cholera outbreaks at different times. And the problem was as a result of decaying infrastructure. It's like I said, even if government has very good intentions, if government has good intents of providing a, a clean, a, a, a good wash, clean water, safe water, what about infrastructure? It is very, very important. Now for Nigeria, what is the wash infrastructure situation in Lagos? We find out that the, the uh, a water works uh, facility in Iju was built in 1915. And the, the, that very water work, the original idea or the original intent for building that was to supply water to Ikoi, to the colonial masters, because the, the wells that Nigeria used to use then, as at that time, they were good in, in the mainland, but on the island, they found out that the water was brown, brownish, and smelly. So they had to build the water works in Iju and lay pipes all the way from Iju to Ikoi to provide the residents of Ikoi with the water. But eventually, as time went on, and that facility had the capacity to produce 2.5 million gallons of water daily. But as time went on, they found out that they could still give to places like Ebutemeta, they could give to places like Iked, and they could give to Oyingo, Ido, Oto, and the rest. And they continued. But by and by, um, as of 1985, decades later, they increased the capacity to be able to give 45, 000, 45 million gallons of water. But we all know that the uh, uh, population in Lagos had actually increased, so it couldn't do anything. So what is happening? Like I said, my, my study was concerned with what is happening to the people in informal dwellings. In, in slum communities, what is happening to them, and particularly what is happening to children, who will know that poor wash would always not just uh, 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 jeopardize their health, but also lead to uh, mortality. So we see that through the years, the, the Lagos, Lagos Water Corporation kept on improving, increasing the capacity. But as of uh, 20, as of 20, 15, yes, as of 2015, Lagos, the Lagos Water, the Water Works Corporation had a roadmap to improve, at least to improve and expand the capacity to, to give about 745 million gallons of water daily. But as we speak today, they could not do that. Lagos is grappling with a shortfall of about 320 million gallons of water to meet the needs. But now, fast forward to 2022, because the issue of infrastructural decay kept on or keeps on, because it's still on, keeps on being a problem to Lagos. I'll tell you for, for nothing that I live in Lagos. I've lived all my life in Lagos. I live in Lagos and I live in Surulere that is assumed to be one of the uh, uh, good areas. But water infrastructure is a problem. In Ikeda is a problem. In Oingo is a problem. In definitely all the areas is a problem. Uh, there's right now a promise or a proposal to help Lagos get infrastructure that can at least increase the volume of water that can serve negotiations. But I want to say something here, Impro talking about improvised wash infrastructure. If you look at that, this is one of the communities where I also worked. That, that, um, that lemon color uh, uh, facility we are seeing there is a toilet, a toilet built for the community. And that community is about about 4,000 people that are meant to use that. What I tell you from the study I carried out, they don't even use that. The middle of what you are seeing here is a very big canal, like a river. What they simply do, they do open defecation. They defecate into nylon bags and throw it there. We are speaking again. Are you saying that 
communities in slum dwellings should continue to improvise facil wash facilities. Will this work or will the Nigerian child continue to die as a result of poor wash? Let's look at it. I also, I, I try to, okay, okay, fine. So now, if in summary, I looked at uh, uh, wash norm and find it from my study. The wash norm is a yearly survey that is carried out and they look at key indices from wash to be able to ascertain or at least to review how much the area or households are being served with quality wash. And my, the findings, the latest data of uh, wash norm 2021 are very much in uh, convergence with the findings of my work. I will, I will say for, for conclusion, the wash practice in Lagos is very poor. Infrastructure is decaying. Well, uh, even when in some areas they have some facilities, there's still a problem because you just don't provide it. The people need information to be able to understand what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. I'll go on. I'll just okay. I have friends. Okay, fine. Okay, I just please. I think you're in Let me just quickly run through the photo essay. We are talking about uh, improvising uh, wash facilities for communities, but there's a problem. This is a water tanker. It doesn't have cover. Uh, it doesn't have cover. <laughs> okay. Okay. Please. Oh, sorry. It stops. Okay. Yeah, time is off. So we stop there. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hope for our presentation. So we call on the next presenter. Street trading and food security in pre town urban area by Bank Cole Theodore. That time is going. Okay, um, good morning. I am Bankole Tinotui. I'm a first year PhD student with the University of um, Lagos as part of the VIT CUB Urban Lab program funded by the DAD. Um, I'm presenting uh, a study on street trading and food security in the Pitan urban area. I'm a Sahel Union. I must indicate. Very free, that's why. Um, I must indicate. Um, mostly, when we talk about street trading, we mostly do not look at some of the goods or what um, at benefits it contributes to society. In particular, how the food the street trading contributes to food security. Because when we look at food security, we don't look at the individual. We mostly want to look at the collective and forgetting the individual, and it's the individual that forms part of the collective. So basically, I want to look at uh, how street trading in free town particularly contributes to food security of the individual as well as the household. And so this is the outline of my presentation. Basically, when we look at um, food security, there are a lot of definitions that I would prefer. But I prefer to go back to the World Food Summit in 1996. Now look at food security as when all people at all times, our physical and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food that meets the dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. So we have to look at the fundamentals here in this definition that all people. So we are not looking at the collective without the individual. And street trading is a commonality across Africa. There is no African city you go that you not see street traders. It's very common in Lagos, as in Freetown, as in Accra as in the Kumasi or Dakar, it's a commonality across Africa. And so in most of these cities, um, we see street trading as an informal activity that uh, has been able to take part, that we have not been able to integrate part of our urban policy. And so this has caused a lot of problem when it comes to planning, particularly for cities like Freetown, even Lagos, Accra, and the rest. 
And so we look at two um, categories of traders. You have those who are fixed in a location, and then you have the people users or the mobile um, traders who roam in the major streets. Of course, street trading as an experience has exposed a lot of people when it comes to looking at issues around the social structure, the economic, the income. When you look at uh, the even the political influence these street traders wage in some instances, as we've seen in um, political processes across Africa, it's the same like Lagos. The same like Twitter, Twitter see that holds so much political power. And of course, how these individuals are, are able to access and afford food that um, leads to households and as well as communities. Um, it's interesting when I came to Nigeria, people asked me where is Sierra Leone. So when I was doing the slide, it occurs to me to make people know that Sierra Leone is part of Africa mm -hmm. and it's in West Africa. West Africa. <laughs> and it's an English speaking country like Nigeria, colonized by the Brits. It's uh, the 19th smallest country in Africa and the 127th uh, and second smallest in Africa. It's a poor country. Our population is just less than 7.5 million. I cannot imagine Nigerians don't know Sierra Leone that you've contributed so much. <laughs> and there. so Freetown um, is the capital city of um, Sierra Leone. It's one of the oldest cities. And it's the first city where they return the first set of slaves from Europe and the Americas. Like um, Dami indicated, we have slaves that come cut across the entirety of Africa, but we are returned to Sierra Leone, that include Nigerian, that's why I'm bank calling, but I'm not in Nigeria. We have slaves from Cameroon, we have slaves from Ghana. So you go to Sierra Leone, it's a melting pot for Africa in terms of culture, traditions, and way of life. So that city uh, produces almost 30% of our GDP. So the bulk of its popul our population is in, the, it, in, the, in that small city. It was a space created for less than 300,000 people. Today, it has over 1.5 million people. And it's um, densely populated with a lot of urban slums where you have the highest urban core. So most of our urban core are reliant upon street trading or those providing food in the informal sector. And so let's us look at some of the problems people tend to see when they look at street trading and they associate it with what they are exposed to street Punches and criminal extortion. What you call here agos, we call them Rari boys. So Rari boys form the consortium of those who collect fees from street traders in the name of protecting them, like you have the agos here. And uh, in most cases, people consider street traders contributing little, little to the tax base, but they pay market dues. And those market dues form part of the local councils in most of these African cities, and Peter is no exception. And they contribute, people attribute them that they contribute to informality. But it's another debate for another time. What is informality? And to what extent do we see street trading as informality? Because street trading in Africa, even though it's a commonality in our cities, but it's not common to Africa. Street trading occurs in almost every major city in the world. So why do we want to term them as informal? But they are regulated because they have um, structures. They have unions. So if you say they are informal, what are, is the objective of those unions and structures that they have within them? And of course, we say again, they contribute to waste and congestion, but they are not the only one using this, this space. You have those, um, uh, 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 you have the, the, the carpenters, you have, in our instances, you have the, the mechanics, even the vulcanizers, a lot of them are using the same space that the street traders are using, the same street. So the question comes, what is the right to the city? Who, has more right to the city, and how do we determine who has right to the city when they have a contribution to make to even those other people using the same streets they are using? And the flexibility of trading, of course, um, we have seen over the uh, course of the year that many, many streets traders, they evolve. So today, somebody will be in used clothes selling, the next day has moved to another set of business. So there are flexibility, it's in, not just in the the form of the type of business they do is as well the time they contribute and how they're able to um, use the space for different alternative purposes and uses. And there has been a contention of whether re relocation or reintegration. So every time there's an effort to relocate, the question comes about reintegration. If these streets constitute the avenue for them to be able to make income, relocating, to, relocating them to where? So how do we integrate them? It's a contention when it comes to urban planning. An inadequate market stall. This is a crisis in almost every urban communities, every urban cities, because the more uh, people are moving from impoverished 
or deprived communities to the city centers, their first action is always to go into many trades that will be able to keep them sustained and surviving. And so it doesn't matter how many markets you be, you always have more people coming to the trade to continue to do business. So this has always been a challenge. And they are being blamed for pollution, noise in particular. But are they the only one causing noise? How many institutions that are using this, the Bay space there are, uh, uh, are alleging that they are the one causing contributing to noise? So there is a lot of issues that has a lot of contention that has been attributed to speed trading that we still have to dwell on, we still have to think to, and we still have to be able to clarify when it comes to the, their contributions, particularly to food security. So basically, I want to see how I'll be able to understand whether speed trading is a contributing factor or a menace to society, both for the individual and as well as the society. And so, um, in the course of uh, the research, I was able to identify a lot of things that were personally interesting to me. First is that um, most of these three traders support large families. Most of them are sole breadwinners of their family or widows, or even married in some instances or divorced. So it's a place where you find various categories of people. It's not just men or women. It's just a place, a place again where you find sole breadwinners, a place where you find single women, widows, divorce, married. So it's, it's a space that occupies or provides for almost all category of people that do not segregate or discriminate. But in our own case, in most of the cities, you find majority of the spectators are women. I must indicate that our population is mostly female-oriented. Well, 52% of our population is female. And so we have a lot of women into the trade when it comes to street trading. And in the um, aspect of education, today I want to say I'm a testament of street trade. I was born in the market, in one of our most popular markets in Sierra Leone. And um, you find out that most of our street traders, they have some level of education. Where my some secondary, some even university and professional education. But because of the situation of uh, job, and the situation of placement. So many people opt to go into a, a minor or less regulated field with limited capital. Because going to speed trading, you don't need much of the regulations. And the capital you need to go into that field is mostly limited, depending on what, where you want to start from. So it becomes an easy route for many people, even the educated. And of course, it's an um, investment for income and savings. A lot of these street traders have various schemes. You know, in um, Auburn Freetown, they have a lot of schemes that's being run by MFI Multi, um, uh, those microfinance institutions, and as well as the informal one run by women. They call OSUSU. They contribute daily to income, and each month from their contribution, they'll be able to give to one. And that contribution helps some to be able to take care of major costs that include education, health, and in some instances, to be able to even build a house or some major other investment. So it's as well an income and savings scheme. And it's a job, like every other profession. Most street traders work, they have an opening hour and a close hour. And most of them contribute a lot of time into what they're doing. And the maximum time from our survey is that 13 hours is the maximum time, and some give eight hours. And that eight hour for the minimum is mostly for women who fall within the category of lactating mothers or um, some women who are married. In some instances, when the husband is not part of the field. So they too contribute to job creation. They employ themselves. And so they go to work like every other person, but yet we're seeing them as more of a problem than contributing to society. And then the last finding is that they contribute to household income and social welfare. They are able to contribute to the income that comes to the house and be able to provide for their own security. Uh, this is so basically when we talk about speed trading and their contribution, it's part of the ongoing conversation and um, with both the government and local authorities to see how they can be able to integrate speed trading, speed traders in the development strategy when it comes to current urban planning. We have to be able to think about them in the uh, perspective that it's a strategy they are using out of what we refer to as poverty elevation. If you want to take poverty out, you have to be able to meaningfully contribute firstly to yourself and then collectively 
to the household and community. So street trading has benefited a lot, the vulnerable household and of course the urban poor. And so some of the recommendations, firstly, it's the means of livelihood for many people, therefore, we should be able to consider when it comes to the physical planning of economic sustainability of the urban poor. If you go to other cities, like you see from one of the videos, this is uh, in the heart of Berlin. It's a place they call Bikini Berlin. This place is a market in the heart of Berlin, but it was integrated part of the community. And in this place where Bikini Berlin is, is where you have the Technical University of Berlin, a host of other important institutions. But there's a market in the middle of all of them, and people are accessing it. And it was created, designed in a way that it integrated part of the physical planning and it's creating an economic contribution for people. So we should be able to think around again our policy measure and incorporate the design of uh, trade spaces for traders in instance of solving the problem of their own activities. And of course, um, laws, you know, most of the street traders, are, as I indicated, they are not protected by legal or uh, 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 legislation. Mostly um, local authorities are seeing them as a problem and then the local boys as well are seeing them as problems. So they become vulnerable to every facet of society. And of course, lastly, it's important for government to encourage training institutions to support them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thankfully. Well, let me just say one or two things on the papers presented before we now the answer question and answer session. The first paper, Politics of Water, presented by Dr. Miara, uh, explicitly explained the problems and challenges of water supply in a boy state, and that. The government need to do a lot to improve the water system in the state, that the water supply is poor, and that is creating a lot of problems in the state because of so many poor environmental sanitation, which lead to diseases like cholera, epidemics, and so on and so forth. So between domestic and border streets, Violence presented by Amy Tope. She too looked at the challenges of year hawkers. We all are aware most of the hawking in Nigerian cities are done by guests. And as rightly said, people buy things on sentiment. Because some people, men, some will not like to buy something, but because it's a year, they would like to buy from her. But the boys will be hawking around, nobody will listen to them, nobody will call them. But once it's a girl, for some of them have been killed or And in that process, that's why the guests are molested. So it's a very serious challenge. And the government should uh, look into that and say, where of uh, putting these guests out of streets, either putting them in a fashion design, uh, hairdressing, or other things that make them safe to life rather than hopping on the streets. In the city, space and justice, low income by Dami Lola. He looked at, she looked at the pre-colonial, colonial and post-colonial settlement Lagos. And they argued that there was what I myself may call apartheid policy of settlement. What have the high settlers by the rich, the low settler by the poor. And so the gap of segregation she argued should be uh, uh, the gap should be bridged and that gap in, in settlement has led to phobia between the less privileged and the high privilege but the less privileged will be angry with the man at the top that is living comfortably has water supply electricity everything she needs but they that are living in small areas lack all those amenities then the Fourth presenter in published water by group appropriate looked at the what we call wash it down wash as the, the water sanitation and hygiene and argued that the lack of uh, infrastructure, particularly this water sanitation and hygiene, and the role of the media has not been effectively carried out. That the media should do a lot. To inform the government of these problems that have been uh, confronted by the people and the work of uh, in them. And uh, the 
government vis-a-vis -vis the no NGOs and uh, other individuals can have what they call partnership to provide some of these amenities to the communities and to the people. Then lastly, on uh, street trading and food securities in free town urban areas by Bankley, uh, we argue that street trading is one of the prominent uh, activities in major towns in Africa, and that uh, most of the urban poor are street traders. And that, uh, but there are what we call flexibility. Some people can move from what grade A to grade B in form of changing uh, their, their, their trading position. But I want to uh, tell Bankole that the person he asked whether he knows Sierra Leone. Is a, is a, I don't, don't think it's from Africa. <laughs> because I know Sierra Leone is a prominent country, particularly for students. And uh, everybody that did history will know about the Creos in Sierra Leone. Uh, they are, these are the returnees, the returnees from Sierra Leone. And Freetown, because of the name, they were settled there as free people. So we know that uh, Nigeria has played the role. The Lekomog, the Gundi, Coup d'etat of Paul Kuroma. The Nigerian Lekomog was there to put things in order and then uh, chase him out of power. So having said that, uh, you made mention of Ayin Boys. Similar to Agro. So there are so you could have Agro in Twitter. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, every presenter. The time is now open for questions and answers, but I don't think that there are going to be more of random in doing that. I have to stand up now. Um, what we are going to do is because of time, you know, we're supposed to end this thing by 11 o'clock. We have 13 minutes. So we are going to take. Huh? Okay. So say by 10 for 10 for five. That means we have 15 minutes more. Okay, so please, the where we'll be taking two, two questions with a presenter. So that we don't care. So those that are presented, when the question is being directed to you take down, you answer the question at the at the end of the question. Yes. Am I am I communicated? So all the questions should are done answered simultaneously after the question. So Start a question and uh, direct it. You have to pick it. Yes. Okay. Yes. The man on cards. Okay. Thank you. I'll speak it. Yeah. Uh, my question is on the presenter. Well, very interesting because I have personal experience in staff. So the politics of I think it's not only because the other thing is that because the resource water is still as much as So that is why our politics not the issue of country and country. But I say it is better for the researcher to look at what happened before the 1999 because many areas in Nigeria, neighbors, but on the other areas, the politics that is since the last colonial periods, when they introduced high school of work. That was why we presented of the first of the town of the little standard. I don't know if you have all the way that as nations, each is where I will, or the other officers were, where you fight the particular area, where the inhabitants for the locals, like another. It means that, so a very important combat and look at services for the research. So the issue of politics for what has been done, I think, is real. Here, I see the very important for the Secondly, when you have in like in Nigeria, you have a part of the water generally. I don't know because in Lagos, in Kano, or you have water in this In Lagos, they have a water which was mostly about so, what are the targets in case of so what you say as the other one is going to So, it's very well. Okay. We'll take, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, the ladies. Thank you. My question is for the conversation. Okay, look. Okay, right. Okay, so as far as um, sexual violence, method out on the female street. Um, Female young children, you mentioned, are there other forms of violence meted out on them? Then, um, secondly, 
Secondly, we know that young boys also do work. What kind of, I, I, I know that wasn't the focus of your study, but what kind of violence do young, do young boys face on the streets when they walk? Is there a disparity between the kind of violence they, ex they, they experience for when compared to that of females? And um, do they also experience sexual violence? Thank you. Yeah. So, talking about water, I want to suggest, if I'm right, that water, water bottle are here. We should look at the significance or the importance of water to humankind, not only to, to Nigerians or Africa, even to locals. Every one of us this morning, we have interacted, so to say, with water, many healthy beings. So there is need, even right from the creation of uh, human, human beings, how people for existence because of lack of water. So there is need to to discuss that one. And concerning the, the, the problem, I, I, I'm thinking because to me also I've done something on the uh, challenges of talent, especially in Lagos. As a result of population increase, as a result of the westernization, westernization this has been this issue of uh, pollution. Otherwise, in African society now, we depend on this flowing water, flowing river, for as a means of portable water. But when population is increasing, in this 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 incoming of these Europeans now, everything changed. So that is that. Concerning the, the street trading, and to present that as showcasing that in Nigeria. Or in Lagos, we are very telling you what are. Please, going by the team of this uh, conference, I think there is need for us to decolonize ourselves from all this uh, looking down on Africa. Because to people that have traveled, as we have strong in any part of Nigeria, so also. We have over there. So, for the student bank, we are not trying to glorify this uh, issue of uh, global north. We should, in this 21st century, now we should look at it critically and uh, balance the question because as we are here, here we have poor people, they have poor people, so also they, as they are living in storm here, so also they are. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Tim Topopola. I want to direct my question to Madam um, that talked about um, poor wash. Uh, my question is, do you think the major reason for poor wash is lack of facilities? I grew up in Lagos yeah. and I I Okay, I grew up in Lagos and I could remember when I was small, you know, as a young boy, when we finished playing football around coming from school, we see we see water around. There is, I think it's not only because of the poor facilities. Why do we check the family court? The family also contributed because the training begins at home. And some, some Mr. Daddy has talked of uh, something very peculiar. Lagos were not this congested. It was people coming around that make all these things worse. There was no yes, but it was not as grandpa as this. So, can you please explain? Is it only lack of facilities? Or we have other 
you know, the factors contributed to this. Uh, thank you. Yeah, my first thing is for the uh, for the, the researcher. Okay. Okay. okay, my first one is for um, Tamil Lalika, the presenter. Yeah, you mentioned um less access to infrastructures by low income for low income um materialized. You mentioned something like that about um, um infrastructure being made um, on them um, inaccessible for the marginalized people and um low income areas in Lagos. So my question goes to say, can you shed light about this low income areas where access to infrastructure really is not feasible in Lagos? Because we need to be careful when it comes to um, um raising um some issues about a particular environment or territory. Because I grew up in Lagos and I know what the dynamics are. And uh, yes, and the other thing is um, what are those inaccessible infrastructures, and who are those that do not have access to those um stated um, infrastructures you are talking about? And um, you said a way um another way with uh, Lagosian, sorry. That's second. The another way the legation fights back is by allowing some people to sleep under the bridges. You made, you made mention of that. Yeah, you made mention of that. I think I don't know if that was a mistake anyway. So I'm saying those people that um sleep under those bridges, is it that the legation intentionally put them under the bridges? Or what do you mean by that statement, please? So there should be one. Okay. So after, after this period, we stop. This uh, question goes to this question goes to Damilola Olani. Yeah, Lagos is the smallest state in Nigeria, going by the landmass. Ironically, it has the highest population. How can Lagos be decongested? Because forget about improvement of infrastructure. Lagos needs to be decongested, forget it. So how can it be decongested? Then the second question goes to Hope Afoke Oribe. You said Nigeria has highest mortality rate or whatever. Nigeria, has, our population is go, growing by in a progress, um, geometrical progression. It's booming. Then how do we have highest mortality rate? I don't get it. How do you have that? How, what are the yardstick? For Nigeria, yes, but that's it. Half, half population is, is booming anyhow. I don't get that. Okay. okay. My own is just an observation. And I I tend to buttress what uh, you just said. I think you made mention about uh, our city being like uh, some notable cities like uh, New York, uh, Bali, what have you. So that we need to decolonize the way we see. Okay, what was okay, what, what? To be like that. Okay. Exactly. Okay. All right. Thank you for the clarification. So my question is for yes. My question is for Damilola as well. So I'm interested in the disciplinary wow. perspective from which you're carrying out your research because um, you tended to talk about the past and the present of Lagos. So, so I won't waste time, I'll just go ahead to read it. So as a historian, I'm aware of the policies and laws that um, have been inherited by the independent Nigeria slash Lagos that keep on shaping today's politics. So an example is the 1978 Land Use Act that we have now, which was inherited from the 1902 policies of the um, colonial government. And this has implication on the social um, justice that your work talks about, because what that means, the inherited, the inherited and policies is now, for example, on the royal families who tend to displace the small but less influential families and take over these spaces. That's the first question. The second question is, um, 
you mentioned classism, not as a word, but as the, as, uh, you get what I mean. So, um, and I then want to, I want to um, ask about the intersection of these classes, especially in a place like Lagos, where domestic servants go to Ikoi and all these high rise areas to work and how sometimes they see the kind of infrastructure that is available in these places, then aspire to these things when they go back to this space. Because you see that over time, the middle class grow, uh, the middle class as growth from the um, low income classes. So I hope that was quick. <laughs> now we are going to answer the questions based on the presentation. So the first presenter will answer his uh, question and we feel at the point. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Doc, uh, I refer to you if I had known that you would be here. I would have preferred to defer my presentation. Reason being, yes, reason, reason being that I'm just assuming it is a day back uh, a time because I was there when you presented yesterday and I, I recall I asked you the same question on water defense. And now I'm presenting on water supply. You also threw the back, back the question to me. Nevertheless, uh, the actually the work supposed to look beyond 1999. But uh, you know, because of the peculiarity of our place, I am from a boy state. Uh, the policies of water supply actually started in 1999 when we had you know, the first executive government or executive governor in the person of uh, Dr. Sam Mayubu. He tried to build water supply within his own senatorial zone. And when the second uh, uh, executive governor came on board, he also no, built. He also built. He, he also built uh, uh, the two major power uh, water plants, known as Sufrik water plants and Okawo water plants within his own uh, senatorial zone. So, but what existed in the uh, colonial times was a situation where people have to dig the ground to allow water come from it and they will fit from there. So there is no politics among the people during that time. Thank you. If... No, no, uh, uh, no, no. Yeah, we don't have time. Yeah. 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 Okay, show me top. Please, uh, you have a question. Thank you very much for your question. Yes, I, I have noted it. Thank you very much for your question. It is two-sided, but I will do I'll try to do justice to the first part of the question, which says that is it only sexual violence that we that the workers on the streets are exposed to? Just like um, my thesis, I mean, sorry, my paper intends to 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 establish is the fact that it is multidimensional violence that is insecurity both in the home and on the street. So. It is not only sexual violence that, that the girl orcas have experienced. Because it is multidimensional, because they are exposed to issues on the street and in the, at, at home, we have issues of uh, exposure to hazards, both in at home and, and on the streets. Exposure to theft, those are the things that we saw on the street. So at, generally, on both sides, we had issues of hazard, that these girl child are more exposed to being getting used to, you know, always in the, at the home front doing chores, hazards in the kitchen, hazards on the street. That is hazard exposure. Then theft and stealing. Particularly. So then, and the issue of time poverty, which is also stealing away their their uh, their their possibilities or chances of getting. Uh, the required formal and informal education that would you know improve their skills and that, that will establish their development so there is also expanded uh, increased vulnerability so because we are looking at not only what they are exposed to on the street but also what they are also facing at home it is two-sided and that is why we have always we are, we are establishing that there are increased issues of hazard, increased issues of vulnerability and problem of uh, time poverty. So those are the things that we have established. 
And then secondly, you talked about uh, boy, boys, uh, you know, looking at the disparity between the, the violence that boys also face in compared to the female. I was tempted to look into the boys' uh, situation too, but it is going to be a distraction and it may make me, you know, dwindle away from from the objective of the research. But by and large, there, I think that there should, be a, there should be a way of factoring in the issues of, you know, boys and how it is different from what uh, boys experience. But just like I have said, because of the multidimensional roles that girls play, because they work in the home and also in the school, they are more... <laughs> and all that. They also have exposures to hazard and so on and so forth. So I'm all right. Hello. 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 I'm, I'm getting you, but uh, what did you summarize? So I no longer, time is yes, no longer. The, yes, the, yes, the summary is that it is, there is expansion of vulnerability, expansion mm. to hazard, more exposure to hazard, an issue of time poverty. So these are the general general findings that we have seen do, but I will okay. still work on the, it, it is still a work in progress, just like I said, and I will, I will keep working on, particularly bringing in the comparison that she has mentioned and establishing the disparity between um, women, I mean, the girls and boys violence exposure. Thank you Thank again you. for- yeah, um, question on low income communities. Excuse me. You asked the question. She asked the question on low income communities that where which which low income communities am I talking about? I showed a map that there are more than 157 slum communities in Lagos. And now the strangest, um, the most interesting thing is within those communities, there are people of different income group as well. Let's take Iwaya, for example. There are people that earn low the minimum um, wages, and there are people that earn higher than that. Their house, um, house policies are different. And so even within a community, there are so communities of low and lowest income com uh, communities. So mostly these low income earners live in slum and squatter settlement. That's why I said, our study, we, we have to choose carefully, select um, specific low income communities. We have not done that yet. And you mentioned the infrastructure. Uh, that's another thing we want to look about, comparison. The infrastructure deficits in a particular community will definitely be different for another. So I can't say specifically the kind of infrastructure, they, but we're looking at general infrastructure and the people that sleep under the bridge. If your question, the operational word is allowed. I didn't say we allow them to live there. I said Lagos are resourceful in a way and resourcefulness in, in Lagos might be good or bad. So if they don't get places to live, some people resort to living under the bridges. And I'm not saying the people allow them to do that, or it's out there, we should continue to do that for them. But because they do not have where to live, they just think that's the best option for them. So it's, I'm just talking about resilience, means of survival within Lagos. Yeah. How can Lagos be decongested? De now, that issue is an issue of Nigeria. If all the cities in Nigeria are well developed, if people are satisfied with where they live, sorry, I'm not standing. If people are satisfied with where they live within Nigeria, they will not come to Lagos. And if you ask people, why do you come to Lagos? You are looking for the greener passion. Lagos is the jackpot of Nigeria. So we are looking for the greener passion. I'm looking for better opportunities. That is the issue of income inequality and social okay. inequality in Nigeria. I have another question. So, so what is Yes, there are two questions. Okay, the young man that said, uh, I said Nigeria is no under five mortality rates. Nigeria, I used the 2019 data from WHO, from UNICEF and CDC. Nigeria was number one on that list. As of 2016, Nigeria was number two behind India. But by 2019, Nigeria had got to number one on the five mortality rates in the world as a result of poor wash. So that settles it, you can, you can Google it and find that. Then your question, uh, it's not only uh, the poor infrastructure or decaying infrastructure that causes poor wash. I'm speaking from the, from the perspective of communication, communication for development. Infrastructure one, 
but also exposure to information that can help people. I have experienced it. I work in three urban slum communities in Lagos, and I found that, that even the women, particularly even the Egun women, who don't even have any form of formal education, but because we had engaged with them very well, they called me to ask, Auntie, this, this, this happened. That's happened. What am I saying? Even if they don't have the infrastructure in place, if they have information, if you engage them enough for them to understand, to be a part, don't come and talk to them. Engage with them. If they understand the importance of the, the, the quality of good wash, they will seek for good wash. I didn't have time. I would have shown you a video where monkeys entered into uh, yeah, uh, water yeah. and they were bathing there. Honorably, you would think that, oh, you have your water and it's safe. But we are saying there's what we call safe water regime that every mother should know. Right here in Queen's College, Iwaya, not even from the uh, community. In 20, you, 20, 20, 21, a lot of children died because they didn't close their water tank in Queen's College. Exactly. They used the, the, the poor water and children died in Queen's College. Thank you. Thank you. You have a question. Okay. I want to I want to thank I thank everybody for this honorable uh, presentation at Great Hall based on this this session and so on. Thank you. 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 Thank